I'd just uh, give a couple examples of projects in my lab um, that have formed the basis of a couple of PhD theses that use um, euthorium helium thermochronology. But before I get into these particular specific examples, I just wanted to, again, reiterate a point that Jim made in his talk is simply the huge diversity of potential applications of euthorium helium thermochronology. This is a field that right now is in a, a rapid stage of, of growth. It's only been really widely utilized for the last um, 15 to 20 years. Um, and for example, a, a few weeks ago, um, the 2014 International Conference in Thermochronology was held in France. Um, and a number of us who have given talks in this um, uh, in the last two days um, attended that conference, and it was pretty astounding just the huge range of applications that people are are um, coming up with for helium thermochronology. And um, simply because it is such a young tool, there are a whole variety of phases that can be dated with euthorium helium that have just actually barely been touched. Maybe there's just a couple publications on them, or perhaps just a few abstracts. And by developing some of the fundamentals of those other thermochronometers, it can provide us with access to additional temperature ranges and additional rock types that we can actually use to decipher a variety of processes and address all kinds of new questions. So um, I was just going to highlight a few examples of some of the different things that we're doing in uh, the lab at CU. Um, typically, my students work on some aspect of, some, uh, of method development or methodological testing along with um, application to some kind of geological problem. Um, specifically, a, a couple things that we're doing now, we're working on conodont bioapatite um, helium thermochronology. So conodonts are um, phosphate uh, uh, microfossils that are common uh, in um, Paleozoic and early Mesozoic carbonates and shales. And currently, there are no thermochronometers that you can use in these units. And of course, carbonates and shales cover wide, large sections of continental interiors and make up large um, portions of sedimentary basins. And so if we can um, successfully develop this as a thermochronometer, this would um, provide um, a, a very powerful new tool. Um, we're also um, have been working, um, I have a PhD student, Jackie Boffman, who's working on titanite thermochronology. We've been playing around a little bit with garnet and bedellite um, thermochronology. Um, and then another thing that we've um, been focusing on is trying to understand sources of dis dispersion in apatite helium data sets. As Jim mentioned, we know that radiation damage exerts a strong um, control on apatite helium retentivity, which can cause dispersion in data sets. But this is useful dispersion from which we can extract um, lots of thermal history information. So we're focusing on um, trying to develop new ways to further extract um, information from um, dispersed data sets. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight a few of the projects that we're working on. Um, we have a sort of one of our aims um, has been trying to understand the topographic uh, evolution of the interior of the U.S. Cordillera in origin. I was just going to highlight one of the work that Rachel Landman did with me during her um, master's degree. She worked in a, a range that represented the northernmost extent of the Rio Grande Rift. She did sort of a more classical um, uh, appetite um, helium dating of vertical transect study by um, dating samples throughout the exposed Precambrian basement in this rift flank uplift. We got, again, these sort of vertical elevation profiles. And from the, this sort of data set, we were able to reconstruct the um, post-70 million year history involving laramide um, deformation and subsequent um, rift, uh, uh, rifting effects. And so one of the uh, main conclusions of this work was that you know the, the rift, which is shown here, um, extending upwards into the heart of the Rockies. It has this northward tapering geometry that some people have used to uh, suggest that perhaps the Rio Grande Rift sort of propagated northward through time and that it might have be associated with young uplift of the Rockies. And Rachel's work showed that this northernmost part of the rift, it actually has exactly the same history as these other rift flank uplifts to the south. So it looks like the Rio Grande Rift actually seems to have a similar history began opening at about, at about the same time throughout its entire length. Um, and so this is, again, just sort of one example of how um, we can use appetite um, helium data sets. And I should point out, you know, so um, there are both Jim and John mentioned using these sort of vertical elevation transects, and this is sort of a classic way in which we use appetite helium thermochronology, but increasingly we're um, able to um, apply this tool um, in areas without needing a vertical elevation transect, in part by exploiting things like radiation damage to access a range of closure temperatures um, within a given a single appetite suite. Um, and then again, we're um, in some of this work. We're beginning to toy with some of the higher temperature thermochronometers, both uh, Josh Johnson and Wes Weisberg. They've both been working on uh, uh, using some other thermochronometers um, here in the Rockies to try to understand the earlier history um, before the Laramide. Because although you think, you know, well, we know a lot about Western U.S. evolution, there's actually big gaps in that history about which we actually know very little, simply because there aren't many 
thermochronometric tools that can access that part of the, the um, history. All right, some other projects I've been um, involved with um, applying thermochronology to try to decipher the history of Grand Canyon carving. That's work that we're continuing to do. We have another new project um, with Allison Duval and Greg Tucker. This is sort of more of a geomorphic project to try to understand the geomorphic history of strike slip faulting on the North Island of New Zealand and try to link it with the longer history of strike lip um, fault evolution and topographic change in this re region by linking geomorphic models um, with um, low temperature thermochronology. Um, and then we also have a, a new project that's funded by NASA to work on lunar zircons to try to um, understand the um, impact history of the moon. And so these are, again, just some examples of some different things that we're doing. And again, there's just all kinds of things that people are doing with this tool. People have worked on you know, wildfire thermochronology, trying to figure out, understand soil development, and fault motion, um, a lot of work, um, a lot of interest from um, hydrocarbon exploration perspective. I think there's huge potential for application to economic problems. Um, that's essentially been sort of economic geology exploration problems that's sort of uh, essentially untapped. Um, right, so then I thought I'd go in and um, i just give um, two particular examples. Um, we'll see if I get to the second example. I don't know if I'll have time. To, um, to and try to highlight a couple key points with these examples. First, um, the first point is how we're trying to use apatite helium thermochronology and some of the recent advances in it to try to decipher um, surface histories deeper into geologic time and to try to connect these surface histories with um, deeper Earth processes. And as part of this, the second point that I really want to emphasize in this talk of, is the importance, importance of fully integrating your geological constraints with the thermochronometric information that you obtain. Um, because by fully coupling these things, we can obtain a lot of detailed information about um, uh, surface history evolution. And both of these examples I, I chose simply because they're at a, a scale that can sort of be related to a lot of the EarthScope um, data sets. All right, so for um, both of these um, examples, what we're looking at are, are histories that are preserved in, in cratons. And the reason for this is that, you know, to first order, we have a pretty good understanding of the mechanisms that are responsible for elevation change when you're sitting, you know, close to plate boundaries. But there's little consensus on what's driving the elevation change in the middle of continents. And it's actually, there's an increasing variety of um, observations, um, both geologic observations as well as, um, you know, thermochronology data that very clearly indicate that the interiors of these continents appear to be sort of bobbing up and down um, through geologic time. So, you know, commonly people think of cratons as being totally stable. Nothing has happened to them since they've been stabilized. And in fact, that doesn't, is, that is not entirely true. And so, you know, what is driving um, these sorts of motions? And one of the uh, uh, probably most interesting, most important developments in the geodynamics community of the last couple of decades is the idea that changing patterns of flow within the mantle can influence the vertical motions histories of continents. And so um, this is the so-called dynamic topography, which is typically characterized by very long wavelengths and, and low amplitudes. And um, you know there are a lot of models that are increasing in sophistication and diversity, but I think one of the big challenges with these models right now is our ability to test them. Because um, uh, and to um, and to be able to definitive, definitively identify dynamic topography in the rock record, because one of the challenges is that because dynamic topography is relatively low amplitude, it gets swamped by the much larger signal of sort of lithospheric thickening and crustal thickening processes processes that happen during tectonism. So it can be very difficult to tease out the signature of dynamic topography in the rock record. And so I would argue that one of the best places to do that is in the middle of cratons, where you know at the, these sort of cryptic elevation changes have sort of long puzzled geologists. And in this setting, if your continent is actually undergoing elevation change, you, it's hard to invoke tectonic processes or other mechanisms in order to explain that elevation change. And so today I'm going to um, focus on two different areas. Again, I might just get to the first one. We'll see. First, I'm going to talk about the work that we've been doing in the North American cratonic interior and how we're using low temperature thermochronology to try to decipher the sort of large scale um, Phanerozoic history of burial and roofing and elevation change. And then try how we're trying to decipher the mechanisms that are causing that by comparing those results with dynamic modeling predictions. And then um, we, what we ultimately want to do is to be able to use this surface record to begin to test, calibrate, and to refine some of these mantle dynamic models. And then in the second example, again, I don't know if I'll get to this, is from Southern Africa, um, where we're, um, this is one of actually two places on Earth where people point to and say that this area is dy not dynamically supported today. And people feel like there's strong evidence for that. And here we're trying to um, directly date kimberlites, 
um, and to, so that we can directly tie our thermochronologic record with um, uh, synchronous changes in the lithospheric mantle um, that we can identify by mantle xenoliths that are from within the same pipe. So again, in both of these pl places, we're trying to link the surface record with um, sort of deeper processes. And one of the um, uh, uh, things that we're going to be using today are our kimberlites, which are um, kind of weird features. So kimberlites are a small volume, uh, volatile, rich melts. Um, that are commonly diamondiferous, which is why there's so much interest in them, that are derived from hundreds of kilometers deep um, in the mantle. And there's a lot of debate about the you know, petrologic and tectonic and geodynamic mechanisms that might drive um, kimberlite magmatism. And um, in most cratons, we have kimberlites, and they uh, repeatedly are in place, but they're also episodically in place. And an interesting thing about kimberlites, of course, they're pretty famous for having a, a deep record within them. So they are, um, you know, a uh, drive somewhere down here, deep within the mantle. They come blasting up the surface, and along the way, they entrain pieces of the mantle lithosphere. They can um, entrain class of um, lower crustal uh, xenoliths as well, lower crustal material. And along the way, of course, they pick up diamonds. And so, um, you know, a lot of what we know about the mantle lithosphere comes from this record within the kimberlites. But what is, I think, much less appreciated is the fact that kimberlites also contain a very rich shallow record as well. As these things come blasting up to the surface, they can entrain class of overlying sedimentary material that collapses back down into the pipe. And so later on, if this overlying sedimentary material gets eroded away, if you have these class in your pipes, you know that those rocks were on the surface at the time these kimberlites were in place. And so here's an example um, of a photo from a, of a shale class in a South African kimberlite that we visited last summer. And these, um, the shale isn't preserved um, on the surface here today. You just have basement exposed. But this tells us that when this pipe erupted that that shale was there. Another useful piece of information is that kimberlites are characterized by dot, um, characteristic facies that correspond with specific depth ranges. So if you go out and look at whether the, your kimberlite currently has a crater facies or diatreme facies exposure, that can give you information about the total magnitude of erosion that occurred since the pipe was in place. And so what we're doing is then we're trying to link that various, those various pieces of information with apatite helium thermochronology. And of course, Jim um, covered this technique earlier. So it's important to note that not only from helium, um, you know, commonly we're thinking about unroofing histories, but also we can constrain burial histories as well, because we're, um, as we have this temperature sensitivity from really about 90 down to about 30 degrees C. And so we can constrain both cooling and heating histories that can give, give us information about both burial and erosion. All right, so this first example, I'm just going to um, just try to highlight some of the key points from um, this work that we've been doing. So here's just a simplified geologic map of the um, interior of the North American continent, where in red is exposed Precambrian basement. Um, in blue are Paleozoic sequences that unconformably overlie the basement, and then green are Cretaceous units that unconformably overlie those older units. And so um, there's been a variety of sort of mantle dynamic studies that have actually tried to explain the distribution of sedimentary rocks within the interior of the North American continent, and as well as elsewhere. And they commonly use this preserved sedimentary record to calibrate their models. So they look and say, OK, well, when we're having deposition, this means that there's subsidence. And when we have unconformities, this means that there's erosion and uplift. But of course, a, a, an intrinsic sort of shortcoming of this approach is the fact that the sedimentary record is incomplete. So dynamic topography is thought to be ephemeral, so that if you have a, sort of a short-term phase of mantle subsidence that causes burial, um, later on, it's quite likely that you're going to have a complementary phase of uplift that's going to erode those sedimentary packages. So you, know, you have an incomplete sedimentary record. And so what we're trying to do is use helium low temperature thermochronology to try to address this particular shortcoming. Because by dating samples of Precambrian basement across here, we can actually use the appetites to essentially detect the thermal imp imprint of sedimentary strata that were once present across this region, even if these rocks were later eroded away. And so um, we now have uh, data. This is much of this work was carried out by Alexis Alt, um, who worked on our PhD thesis with me. She's now a tenure track faculty member at um, Utah State University. And so here's the distribution of points that we have all across the Western Canadian Shield. All these points record Paleozoic ages. So although this basement is all Proterozoic in, or older Proterozoic or Archean in age, the history that it's recording is much younger than that. We also have a variety of data now that we're acquiring in the interior of the US mid-continent. And these are some of the other areas that we're targeting. And some of the key um, 
things that we're learning from this data set is that number one, although across the entire interior of the North American continent, now uh, all the pink stuff is where Precambrian basement is exposed, we know from this data set that these blue units, the Paleozoics, once covered this entire region of the Western Canadian Shield and were later eroded away. We also know from this data set that the Cretaceous covered a lar much larger region of the continent and also that there's substantial spatial heterogeneity in this history. So not only can we figure out the spatial extent of these units, we can figure out how much of it was there, how spatially heterogeneous it was, in the history even in patterns of erosion of these now denuded sedimentary packages. So I'm just going to now zoom in to the slave craton and just give one um, specific example of a reconstruction that Alexis put together for this area. Again, we have dates, I think, now for about 25 samples across this region. Again, they're all, um, they range from about 350 to 250 million years old. And um, so here, again, we've zoomed in to the slave craton. Now, the diamonds here represent kimberlites of different age that have pierced the craton um, and at different times. And these, um, many of these kimberlites contain class of sedimentary rocks, of um, Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary rocks that um, tell us unequivocally that sedimentary rocks once covered this region and they're now all gone because we only have Precambrian basement exposed. And these different kimberlites have differing exposure levels, um, uh, whether they're exposed at crater or diatreme or hypabyssal facies. And so here's just a, um, a thermal history simulation of some apatite helium data from um, the acastum ice um, over here. And um, here, so you're looking at a time temperature, a time temperature plot going from um, uh, the beginning of the Paleozoic to the present. And these are the kinds of thermal histories that we're able to constrain with this data set. And so now I'm just going to walk you through um, sort of Alexis's reconstruction for this region. So we know that today, um, so we just have Archean basement that's exposed at the surface, and the craton's now sitting at about 500 meters in elevation. Um, we know that 450 million years ago, that when the cross kimberlite was in place, that we had a thin veneer of cambrial ordervician sediments across this region because there are class of that material contained within those kimber that kimberlite pipe. We know 375 million years ago, about that time, that this entire slave craton was covered by at least three kilometers of um, sedimentary rocks that were probably marine. Um, and we know this based primarily on the thermal chronology data from across this region. And we know that by 175 million years, that you've denuded most of the sedimentary section and you um, emplaced the Jericho kimberlite. It contains a little bit of this Devonian material within it. Um, uh, and again, the thermal chronology data tells us that you must have denuded much of that section by this time. By 100 million years ago, we've now reburied the craton by up to a kilometer and a half of marine sedimentary rocks. And we know this because younger kimberlites contain class of Cretaceous marine units within them. And then by 50 million years ago, we've eroded some of that Cretaceous. We've put a little bit of tertiary back on top, and this tertiary is um, now terrestrial. And then by today, we've denuded that material off, and so we're left with no um, sedimentary cover across the craton. And we also know that since 100 million years ago that we've had at least 250 meters of elevation gain of the slave craton, because the slave craton is now at 500 meters, and in the Cretaceous, it was, it was at sea level. Um, and so the point here is that although, you know, here, today, we've just got exposed Precambrian basement, we can actually, with a very high degree of confidence, reconstruct this pretty dynamic history of repeated burial um, and roofing and elevation change. And of course, the underlying question that we're interested in is, well, why, why is this happening? Why is this happening in the middle of this craton when you're sitting far away from the plate boundaries? And so there are two sort of end member ways that you could explain this. I mean, there aren't that many mechanisms that you can call on. You can have either long-term sea level rise and fall, um, while the craton's just sitting there and sea level's going up and down, or you could have the craton itself going up and down. And so we can evaluate, so we're just gonna actually just focus on the Paleozoic, Mesozoic part of this history. So here I'm showing um, the burial and erosion history of the slave craton shown here as fields, okay? And to evaluate the long-term sea level rise and fall, I'm just comparing it with um, several long-term sea level curves. And here I'm actually showing sea level rise in the negative direction and sea level fall in the opposite direction just to facilitate comparison with the bottom plot. And if we actually look at the time interval when we're burying the slave craton, you see that when burial is happening that we're actually coincide with an interval of long-term falling sea levels. And we would expect that falling sea levels would induce an erosional signal in the rock record, not a depositional one. So I think we can pretty confidently eliminate sea level change as the primary cause of this history. I mean, it's clearly it's going on. It's just not what's driving the history that we're seeing here. So I think this means that we're essentially left, well, the craton has to be undergoing some sort of elevation change. 
And is that tectonics? I would say it's probably not because we're sitting far from the plate boundary. We're talking, actually, if you look at the entire region for which we have thermochronology data, we're talking about a 1,500-kilometer-long region that's being affected at a time when there's no sort of crustal deformation going on. Um, so it's, I think it's unlikely to be tectonics, and the signal that we see is a very long um, wavelengths and low amplitude, the kind of signal that we would expect from a dynamic mechanism. So um, we um, have begun collaborating with Xi Zhang, who's in the physics department at CU, and he's a geodynamicist which carry, who carries out global models of mantle convection, and to first order, he's evaluated, you know, well, what happens um, to the Earth's surface as you have supercontinent uh, assembly and breakup, for example, during the assembly and breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea. And so we've taken his models, and we just he took his models, and he predicted the elevation change history for the Canadian Shield in this region where we're working. And what we find, so the red line represents the predictions of his dynamic model, overlaid with my burial and unroofing histories from um, Alexis's data from the, the slave craton. And what you can see is that um, there's a phase of dynamic subsidence that shifts to dynamic uplift that pretty well coincides with our shift from burial to erosion in the slave craton um, record. Um, you can also actually see that the magnitude of dynamic topography that's predicted, the magnitude of that change is about 700 meters, um, which is um, about three times greater than the total sea level fall, um, sea level change that's happening, so that we would expect this dynamic signal to be the dominant one in um, this history. And then you can also see, because dynamic uplift is happening, that we would expect this to induce an erosional signal and therefore um, you know, remove the sedimentary rocks that were earlier deposited. And so from this, we conclude that dynamic topography is, a, um, I think, a probable first-order cause of this sort of long wavelength elevation change um, in this region. And so now we're sort of beginning to, we're trying to expand um, these studies um, into, we're, we're doing, we want to do some more work in the U.S. mid-continent, work across the southern Canadian shield, to more fully decipher these sort of sorts of large-scale patterns of burial and erosion, um, and you know how they're spatially varying across the continent, so then begin to um, more fully compare them with the predictions of the dynamic models, and then also in turn, I think we can begin to use this history to better um, calibrate and refine some of those dynamic models. All right. So um, my second example from Southern Africa. Um, so Southern Africa is sort of interesting. So Southern Africa is a plateau. It resides at a mean elevation of about a kilometer. Um, it's unusual because unlike all the other major continental plateaus on Earth that were in some sort of a contractional plate boundary setting that when they went underwent elevation gain, um, so the Southern African plateau was completely surrounded by extensional um, plate boundaries when it um, became elevated. Um, the geodynamicists get really excited about Southern Africa because underneath Southern Africa sits the so-called African superplume, which is the most significant um, low seismic velocity anomaly in the deep mantle on Earth. And because it spatially um, coincides with the region of the elevated topography in Southern Africa, people point to this and say, well, this area is dynamically elevated, which means then that people really want to know the elevation history here. When, this, did the, when did this re region go up? Because if it is dynamically elevated, if we know something about that history, we can then learn something about the underlying sort of dynamic drivers for that history. And then Southern Africa, so it's um, cored actually by the Capval Craton. You know, the earlier history of Capval assembly and everything is actually in some ways somewhat similar to um, that in the Canadian Shield. It's just that this region has subsequently been rifted all around, um, and it's now sitting at a mean elevation of um, uh, much higher, of 1,000 meters. It's been repeatedly pierced by kimberlite pipes throughout its history, and it has this uh, a dramatic escarpment that um, is sort of a, a classic feature of Southern African geology. And so um, Jessica Stanley is a PhD student who's working with me who's, actually, who's been working at trying to understand the erosional history across the Southern plateau, African Plateau and um, how it might be tied with the history of um, elevation change by specifically um, targeting kimberlite pipes, which are shown in the diamonds across this region. And so um, I was, thought I would just first highlight, you know, why would we work on the kimberlite pipes themselves? Um, there are a couple reasons for this. First of all, by um, targeting these kimberlite pipes, so they're coming in at different times, so we can date kimberlite pipes of differing age. And unlike the Precambrian basement that has this really protracted thermal history that integrates a large part um, potentially of the history of this region, um, the, the, by dating pipes that are coming in at a younger time, we can much more precisely constrain the erosion history. And by dating pipes of differing age, we can precisely constrain the erosion history at different points in time. Um, another reason is because we can exploit this um, shallow record that is preserved within the pipes. 
And the third thing is that we can actually begin to couple our results with the deep record that's preserved within these pipes. So just specifically targeted in this first study, um, pipes of two different ages, sort of a, a suite that's 120 to 140 million years and a younger suite that's 80 to 100 million years. And studies of the mantle zentalis in these two pipes suggest that there's thinning, heating, and metasomatism of the lithosphere and warming of the geotherm between the emplacement of these two pipes. So if this is true, then we would expect an erosional signal in the rock record during this time interval when we're having this event happening deep in the lithosphere. Okay. Oh, well now I'm done to one. Okay. <laughs> I'll be quick. So, um, yeah, so uh, Jess, Jess uh, so she um, has integrated the kimberlite uh, results. She's done a whole bunch of thermochronology work on kimberlite pipes of differing age, has integrated with the geologic constraints, and comes up with this detailed and roofing history. And the key thing that I really wanted to highlight is the fact that um, at the time when we, we see this um, shift in the thermobarometry of the mantle zenolis from a um, Craton-like geotherm shown here in blue to a warm air geotherm. This coincides with um, when we see the erosional event that's happening across the craton. So we feel like we can begin to say pretty definitively that the, this erosional signal that's recorded by the kimberlites is happening synchronously with um, this event that is recorded by the mantle zenoliths that occur in exactly the same pipes. And so now Jess is working on sort of a broader, so that initial work was um, here. It's actually sitting, this is the edge of the Capval Craton. She was working just off the Capval Craton on this suite of pipes. And she's now working on a broader study of kimberlite pipes all across the interior of the Craton to try to understand, are the erosional patterns on and off Craton similar? Um, if not, why not? People have actually suggested, David Bell, who's done a bunch of work on these pipes, has suggested that you actually have much more modification of the lithosphere off Craton than you do on Craton. So you might expect a difference in those histories. And then, you know, if we can sort of isolate the lithospheric effects, maybe then we can begin to also understand something more about the deeper dynamic effects. And I'll stop there. Thanks.